welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Edinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we're talking about Phoenicia today. Ancient empires, old and new. Well, they're ancient, so they're all old. Um, <laughs> but a couple of high-level <laughs> reminders about how we think about the ancients before we dive into specifics. Um, Phoenician is kind of an umbrella term kind of historically imposed. Um, They didn't think of themselves as a a people group, except insofar as they shared ancestry. So in the same way that we wouldn't think of the ancient Greeks as having an allegiance to a place called Greece, we would think of them in their individual cities. Same thing. We've got city-states here, Mm. um, and these city-states are similar to what we've seen in other ancient realms. We've talked about ancient city-states a lot. Um, They're religiously organized around ancestor worship, and I think we'll probably get into the specifics of Canaanite worship um, a little bit later. Um, but that is what we're talking about. These are Canaanite peoples. Um, Which is the term that they used for themselves versus the Greek term of Phoenician and right. the Roman term of Punic. So, right. so if you've we're, heard of the we're Punic going Wars, with everything. we'll talk about those. Yeah. We're going with everybody else and using the Greek term for, yeah. for things. Yes. And of course, the Greeks didn't call themselves Greek, so it's all fair. <laughs> it's all fair in ancient history. <laughs> it, it, it's hard to get information about the Phoenicians, um, except from the Bible, interestingly enough. Um, there is some information later about Carthage, mainly from Polybius and Livy, the Roman historians. Um, but other than that, they haven't left much for us to find. Um, I guess there are some theories that it's because of a lot of trade secrets. They didn't want people to know where they got their good stuff because the most notable trait of the Phoenicians is their trade and their trade routes. Should we start there? Is that a good place to start with? Well, let's go back to the beginning and then we'll, we will move quickly to there and we'll let Rachel talk about trade and trade routes at length as far as she <laughs> wants to. Uh, you already said that, or one of you said that the name uh, Phoenician was opposed upon them. When I was a kid, I was told that it means either blood red people or land of palm trees. Who knows? <laughs> the Greeks made it up. The Greeks misnamed mm-hmm. everybody. They didn't call themselves Phoenicians. They called themselves, and so as far as they called themselves anything after their ancestor, Canaan. They were Canaanites. Now, those who know the Bible, suddenly bells are going off. Oh, wait, weren't those the bad? Yeah, they were. The story begins after the flood. Mm-hmm. Noah's son, Ham, has had a child whom he named Canaan. And Ham commits uh, an offense of grave disrespect against his father. We won't talk about all the details. But in consequence, Noah utters a prophecy that shapes the future of the ancient world on into the New Covenant. Uh, He promises that Messiah will come through Shem, that one of of Noah's sons. Japheth, the elder, will share in that blessing and be greatly expanded. That would be um, Europe and on down into India. And when he gets to Ham, he doesn't put a prophecy on Ham specifically. That would be one third of the human family. So he picks out the one son. Canaan. And since Ham had committed a sin against his own father, he's being judged in his own son. But the form of the judgment is interesting. God, or God through Noah says, uh, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall, be, shall he be unto his brethren. He said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. And Canaan shall be his servant. Now, it starts with a servant of servants. And it all depends what in the world that means. <laughs> and it also depends upon one's understanding of biblical judgment. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christians today don't like to think of a God as a God who judges in history. We'll give him the end of the world in Judgment Day, barely. But a God who judges in history is a little too personal and... It, it acts like God actually gets mad at sin or something. There's truth in all of that, but there's another truth as well, that when God 
if we survive a judgment, that judgment can become discipline. It can point us out to a better way of living, to, to turn from our rebellion, to seek the face of God. And for instance, uh, Jacob, after a fashion, cursed his sons, Simeon and Levi, and said, God will divide you in Israel, scatter you. It's like, whoa, that doesn't sound good. And yet each of them, because of later faithfulness and obedience, because they kissed the rod and submitted to God's judgment, gained great blessings. The Levites were scattered as teachers of the law throughout Israel, and they inherited the priesthood. Simeon was scattered with the borders of, borders of Judah, which meant that when the northern tribes went apostate, Simeon, to some extent, was preserved from that. So as we look at this, servant of servant can mean two things. It can mean the lowest of the lowest, or it can mean the very best servants there are. Mm -hmm. And as we go forward, I'll just throw this out in case we forget to come back to it later. We know that when Israel invaded the promised land, they displaced and in some cases killed a great many Canaanites. But one tribe, the tribe of Gibeon, Hivites, came and through subterfuge managed to make nice nights with Israel and became servants to the tabernacle. And all the way through the monarchy, through the captivity, to the other end of things, the restoration, they still remained faithful to God and to his service. And God counted them as worthy of being the best of servants, the servants of his own tabernacle, because they clung to the promise when there seemed no hope at all. So that's the background here. As we pass through the table of nations in chapter 10, we come across Canaan, and we are told, Canaan begat Zidon, his firstborn, and Hath, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Girgashite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvidite, and the Zimurite, and the Hamathite. And afterwards were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. And the border of, of the Canaanites was from Zidon, as thou comest to Gerar, and to Geza, as thou goest to Sodom and Gomorrah, and so on. So Canaan had a lot of sons, and immediately there's no fulfillment of this prophecy, as far as we know. That's off in the future. Uh, he had a lot of sons. The first one listed is Zidon. Notice the Tyre is not listed mm -hmm. uh, because Tyre doesn't come along. It's not the first of the cities. It comes along much later in history. But Zidon was one of the first Canaanite patriarchs, and he obviously founded a city he named after himself. And a lot of these other families also moved into what the Bible knows as Canaan, what we call Palestine today, and settled there and became... Um, tribes that later uh, Joshua would have to deal with. So that's the beginning of these people that today we call Phoenicians. As one of you said earlier, they honored the memory of their ancestors, uh, as did the Egyptians. And so we, they, they look back to Ham and to Canaan and to the other uh, men in that line, uh, Nimrod and um, Cush, and these became their deified leaders, and we'll talk more about their religion later. But they settled in the, the land of Palestine. Palestine refers to the Philistines. The Philistines were to the south. The Canaanites took up the main area, and then their two most important cities are Tyre and Sidon, mm -hmm. which are on the sea coast, which gave them that wonderful opportunity to engage in coastal trade and trade throughout the Mediterranean. So um, this might be a good time, Rachel, to tell us what you know about all that. Well, where we start is the somewhat interesting historical overlap of the point where they see in the archaeology of a lot of Canaanite cities and people uh, being destroyed in a short period of time, which we would say is obviously the conquest because there were um, a lot of people that were killed, although not all the way up, uh, because the Bible also tells us they did not drive out everybody. So that's why there is still a Phoenician Canaanite people left. But around that time is where we first start to see outposts for their trade around the Mediterranean, particularly many of those outposts will eventually turn into colonies. I, I would say probably the best known of those is Carthage. Uh, but even as they're home area is less secure, they begin to spread out. What's interesting is that they are a trade empire. They never really become a military empire, although they at times will 
offer military support um, as a way of keeping up trade relations. But overall, their focus is always just on being the number one trade. Uh, With Carthage being the notable exception to that. Yes. Yeah. Which uh, my point is more that that comes a lot later. Yes. Um, for many of the years, as I was trying to look up their history and looking for wars and big military guys, <laughs> there aren't really any uh, <laughs> until you get basically to the, the later period. Because when we talk about their trade empire, we're talking about over a thousand years. Um, and in that time period, there aren't many big big battles and such, which is actually makes sense if you're primarily focused on trade mm -hmm. and they have managed to keep the corner on many markets. And so they're not fighting. They're instead making deals or uh, they are keeping their relationships going um, through satisfying the, the desires of different people in different areas. What is interesting is how far they go. Uh, we know for sure that they make it. Um, so their boats are uh, flat boat, flat bottom boats with a single sail. And so they are at least as much as we can tell from the, the outposts and the colonies, they tended to like to stay within sight of the coast. Uh, and so you can see influence all the way around the edge of the Mediterranean, um, going as far as Spain out a little ways to the Canary Islands, but also up to the north in the British Isles. And from each place, they tended to be good at figuring out what was a key item that different places mm -hmm. had that other places would want. And so they both traded their goods out. They carried other people's goods to those places and then brought those goods back. They established their relationships typically through governments, through um, the state, and had fixed pricing and such things so that they would say, we're going to bring you this and this is what item we're going to trade for because they didn't use coinage and that sort of medium of exchange. Instead, they were working more item for item. And often they were moving far enough away that when they were taking stuff to, from, say, the British, they were going to take the tin back over um, to, say, the Egyptians. The, those in the British Isles did not know how valuable it was to the people on the other end. And so <laughs> they were very good at buying low and selling high uh, as they moved around the Mediterranean. And they were very good at moving goods to the places uh, from where they came to people that would want them. They did have their own supply of goods that, of course, they're best known for their wood, for their timber, mm -hmm. particularly all their cedars, which they still have to this day. It's on the Lebanese flag, the, the little tree. And we read a lot about the Lebanese cedars in the Bible, of course. Yes. Yes. So that, that, that would be the corresponding place are the cedars of Lebanon. And from the Bible, we know that we see those used in Solomon's temple. Mm -hmm. They're even used later in Zerubbabel's temple that will become Herod's temple. They are also in the temple of Artemis at mm -hmm. Ephesus, mm -hmm. um, which is considered one of the great wonders of the ancient world. And I believe even over in Mesopotamia in one of the temples, the major structures there. So it, they were sought after commodities because the trees are very thick trees. And so they produce nice, solid wood. Also, they smell really nice. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> a nice benefit in a world where you don't have oh, yeah. necessarily as much uh, <laughs> good smelling things or good smelling people um, that you want some form of good aromatic scent for your for your air um so also keeps the moths of, away from all of the wall hangings <laughs> oh there you go uh one of the other interesting things that i found out that they were an early innovator in is glass production mm -hmm. um we learn in in europe through the 15 16 and 1700s it was a process that they went through of learning to make clearer and clearer glass until you finally get like actual glasses made by Benjamin Franklin and others, uh, but they actually produced clear glass back then and would make various uh, art pieces or things that people wanted, although they actually preferred colored glass. <laughs> so the ones, the artifacts they found that, that the Phoenicians made were more of a colored, sometimes painted, um, but that tends to be some of the, the more artistic things that they did in addition to their famous textiles. Mm -hmm. So they would 
use their trade connections to get many different fibers from different places. And then were the ones that actually brought those together in clothing. And they sold it for, for the people that they basically could sell it back to the people that they had bought the fibers from, but now in much nicer form. Uh, their best known item was the purple dye that they created. Funny enough, the dye came from some places call it a sea snail, <laughs> others a shellfish, mm -hmm. but basically there was a certain variety of uh, shellfish that they had off their coast that they would collect and they could get this color from it. They've still, they found mounds and mounds of shells in, in the area to this day. Although at this point that species is extinct because mm. they used it all Bummer. up <laughs> on all their purple. I know I'm very curious. Like what is this purple <laughs> sea snail shellfish item that, <laughs> that they could use? Um, but they, so basically they were using what was there, but purple in general was a rare color. So they, and especially the version they could get there. So they were able to to supply the needs of all the the wealthy. And often if they wanted to get a, a different market going, they would gift some of the items mm. when they first brought <laughs> Free them there. samples. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they, That's again, how Costco gets you. Yeah. Yes. So they, they would free sample luxury items for the first time, determine that they definitely had buyers, and then basically create a contract and establish trade. The, That's so cool. I feel like this is a really interesting character study where mm -hmm. like they've got the cedars right that, that's one thing they've got going for them as far as natural resources go they don't have a lot else but it's boy did they claw area. their way to the top they're like well <laughs> we will refine anything you have we will make it a luxury item and then you will pay us for it <laughs> like that's just cool right <laughs> yes they even went the other direction to the east not using boats they used land caravans into mesopotamia and as far as india so they were an early innovator also in bringing lots of spices and such back mm. um, for, again, the people that needed a little more in their boring food or whatever they wanted them <laughs> for, good smells. Uh, so they they went, we know for certain they at least went as far as the British Isles and over to India, although there's um, speculation that they may have gone much farther but we can see evidence of them for sure all around the Mediterranean in the, the Northern Mediterranean in Europe, in Greece, Asia Minor, and then all along the North African coast. So they were, they were good at getting to all the different places and finding whatever the people on the other end would want, whether it was food, metals of all kind, gold, copper, tin. They were really the, the middlemen that got everything to everybody that wanted it. Funny, as you were describing them, I had a flashback to Isaac Asimov's Foundation Trilogy, <laughs> because that's the second phase. You were describing it exactly. Once the, <laughs> we have religious dominance, we can do magic, it shifts to, we don't want your magic because we know where that goes. How about a free sample, though? <laughs> and they start offering them free technological samples that will work just a little while. <laughs> is this the traders? Mm -hmm. union yes. Or trade? Yeah. Okay. Let me tell you. Um, we listened to foundations, but we listened to it on an audiobook, which was mm. an absolute mistake. Mm. Um, particularly because science fiction is not my genre. I fell asleep <laughs> so many times. But I also I woke up like after the traders had been yeah. introduced, and in the way it was being read in my head, it was spelled T R A I T O R. And yes. I was like, why is there a union? Like, if they're traitors, why, how, why are they sanctioned by the government? And it was just very confusing. I always felt okay. the need as I was teaching students to clarify when I used that word. He's a traitor, <laughs> not a traitor. Yes. Anyway, um, so that I don't have to recommend Foundation later. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Asimov, of course, was a student of history, and uh, he was trying to demonstrate how various cultures at various times have tried to impose themselves or advance themselves, depending on whose perspective you're looking at it from, uh, on their neighbors. And that was one thing I thought, looking back, I thought he, he did it very well at the time I didn't. When I read it, I didn't care about such things. Like, can we get to more fun stuff? 
<laughs> um, I, was there, before I cut you off, Rachel, was there anything else there that you wanted to talk about? I believe that is all at this point. Okay. Well, let me bring the biblical record up to where you are, because you just spent a thousand years. Uh, we run into the Canaanites again when Abraham comes into their land. God says, I'm calling you into a land that you don't know anything about. And lo and behold, it's the land of the Canaanites. Uh, and Abraham has, he has some dealings with them, but not much. He's mostly out in the wastelands uh, running his cattle. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah are Canaanite cities. We know about them. But when Abraham's faith is being tested, God gives him a vision where he says, you don't get to inherit this land right now because the iniquity of the Amorites is not full. And the Amorites were one of the larger Canaanite tribes he had to deal with. In other words, God's going to give you and your seed the land of Canaan, but not now. Um, it's going to be another 400 years. And uh, after your, and your people are going to serve another nation, Egypt, and after the fourth generation in Egypt, they're going to come back again, and then this will be yours. Uh, and so we, we see occasional interactions in Scripture, but by and large, Abraham's told, not yet. And so most of his interactions there are peaceful, and there's, there are no problems. Uh, his sons have a couple interesting interactions that don't go so well, but still, by and large, the children of Israel are content to bide their time. And then, of course, in the days of um, Jacob and his son Joseph, they end up going down to Egypt. So for a good period of time, we, again, don't hear a whole lot about what's going on in Canaan until God brings his people back out of Egypt through the Exodus. We've talked about the Exodus a good deal. We've talked about Mount Sinai and the giving of the law. And at that point, the children of Israel had been told, okay, you're going to go to Canaan. This is your inheritance. Promise it to Abraham and to his seed. And the seed is Christ, but for now you'll be the caretakers of it, but you have to be faithful. You have to trust God. And they sent spies in, and the spies looked at the land, and it was scary. And so they decided they didn't want to. And God said, fine, then you don't get it. You, you get to wander around the wilderness for 40 years, your children will inherit it. And so after 40 years, after Moses' death, Joshua leads the children of Israel into Canaan and conquers the land. And I think at this point we do have to say something along the issue of genocide, because this is where some people will poke up their ears and say, wait a minute, I've been told that that, that was a horrible thing and that this was genocide. We all know genocide is horrible and, and wrong. We did a um, whole episode on this, by the way, in our did. previous series of Halting Toward Zion. So. Which see? Yeah, see the, all of that, but we'll also recap here. Yeah, we'll recap a little bit of it. Uh, the first thing, of course, we have to understand, and this is really hard for modern men and postmodern men, God owns the planet. God owns the people in it. And when God says, I want my people to have this land, he can do that. And it's not wrong. We're not making right wrong because God owns it. And just furthermore, it was hardly a surprise attack. The children, of Israel, the children of Canaan had known ever since the Exodus that that Israel was coming. Mm -hmm. um, and God gave them an extra 40 years while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And when Joshua sends in the spies and they talk to the harlot Rahab, she says, we have been trembling in our boots since you came out of Egypt. That was 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've heard how God has given you this land. Okay, what might be the smart thing to do at this point? <laughs> well, exactly what Rahab does, right? Yeah. <laughs> yield. <laughs> you can yield or you can run. Probably mm. the one thing you don't want to do is stay there and hope you can beat God. Because they Would had you? seen the miracles. They, or they knew of them. God had, God had built Egypt up into the greatest nation on earth and smashed it to the ground. There was nothing left of it to speak of. So we have Rahab, who did switch sides and was received, though she was a Canaanite. We have the Gibeonites I mentioned earlier, who came to Joshua, pretended that they had come from far away and cut a deal, and they were accepted, although they became slaves to the tabernacle. That turned out to be a really good deal for them. <laughs> yes. Uh, and we can trace their story on through Samuel and the prophets and find out mm -hmm. that God continued to bless those people. Mm -hmm. So there were ways out, and of course, there was the simple one of leave. Mm -hmm. And uh, one group, the Hittites, did. Uh, they went north and founded an empire, and, and for... 
uh, decades and decades, archaeologists and historians said there was no Hittite Empire. There's no evidence of it. They, they, <laughs> they looked where it was supposed to be and it wasn't there. It'd only be later- Because they, they left. They left. <laughs> they, <laughs> later, artifacts began turning up elsewhere and said, oh, wait, here's where it was. Yeah, they were smart. They left. <laughs> they got out. So- uh, uh, But as we look at the text in Joshua, you actually see most of- the kingdoms provoking the yeah. Israelites to war. They actually get themselves together yeah. and they start the majority of the wars, mm -hmm. which is the most foolish thing they could have done. And yet, in many ways, therefore, they're bringing their own demise by their yeah. own foolish pride, mm -hmm. which yeah. is also part of the reason they're being judged to begin with. Yeah, right. Because remember that thing about the, the iniquity of the, the Amorites yeah. is not yet full. <laughs> um, they were not nice people. Um, no. They were no. not spending this time, you know, planting their gardens and uh, um, well, playing Stardew Valley. A, that's another thing we have to grapple with in our modern age is that sin does provoke judgment in this world, not just no. in the world to come, which means when we sin, we provoke God to do that. And he is fully just and righteous in all of that. And yet, at the same time, was very merciful to mm -hmm. those who moved, got out of the way of judgment, to those who repented and switched sides. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who continued in their rebellion and sin, judgment never came upon them because Israel sinned, and Israel fell mm -hmm. into disobedience. And God dealt more harshly with his own people in many ways than he did with the remaining Canaanites. So there's a lot going on there. But I, this might be a good time to, to look at Baal worship, mm -hmm. the Canaanite religion, and uh, see what there was about it that did provoke God to anger. Because we run into Baal and the female counterpart, uh, Ashtaroth or Astarte, in, the in um, Joshua, or I'm sorry, in Judges, the beginning of Judges. Uh, the children of Israel, once they began to settle down, they had not driven out all the Canaanites. And the emphasis there is not that they hadn't killed them all, they hadn't driven them out. They began to make alliances. They began to make marriages. And as God had warned them, once you start marrying unbelievers, you start worshiping their gods. And there were some things that the flesh found very appealing in these gods. Uh, first of all, um, Baal was not the name of a god. It's a title like God or Lord. It actually means Lord. Every city had its own Baal because, as you've already said, every city was founded in terms of its own favorite ancestor. It's dead end. It's, uh, they worship the dead. Uh, in fact, at one point when God is condemning um, the worship of Baal worship of Baal Peor, he says that Israel ate the sacrifices of the dead. It's pretty clear as to what was going on there. Uh, but these these Baals, or Baalim, uh, became identified with nature. Baal is the masculine side, the the storms, the sunshine, the lightning, that which is violent and rough and rugged that which uh, permeates and impregnates Mother Earth. Ashtaroth or Starte, on the other hand, is Mother Earth, the fertility of the land that needs male action to get going. However, Mother Earth was not nice mm -hmm. and is portrayed in the uh, what tales we have from that time, the myths of that time, as wading through the blood of her enemies as she slashed and hacked them. So these, these were not nice gods. Uh, and in order to get nature to do your bidding, the priest of Baal had to come up with that which was anti-natural. Uh, and so, as we read about, say, Elijah's confrontation with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, we see them, first of all, yelling and screaming, no big surprise, nature's kind of deaf and hard to hear, apparently. But then they start cutting and slashing themselves and bringing forth blood to try to get the attention of Baal. And they're screaming- With the idea that self-harm is completely contrary to yeah. <laughs> every impulse that humanity should have. And mm -hmm. therefore, the gods will look at this and be impressed by it. And of course, the greatest thing you can give is the fruit of your own body. Mm -hmm. And so sacrificing your children, either passing them through a baptismal fire or simply burning them on the arms of a searing uh, idol were was considered to- to be the way to really get the God's attention was considered great piety. Because and it was so unnatural and contrary so to unnatural. every human impulse. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and this brings us in passing um, 
to Carthage um, in his uh, book, The Everlasting Man, G.K. Chesterton tries to draw a contrast between the gods of Rome and the gods of Carthage. Carthage was a Phoenician Punic outpost, outpost and they practiced child sacrifice. Uh, the Roman gods mostly didn't. There's been kind of a historical blackout on that one, too. Uh, but they didn't certainly do it as, as regularly. But they were still, as far as the Bible is concerned, demonic beings. So we, we, we have the Roman gods, who eventually will be in the background of the persecution of the church. And we have the Carthaginian gods, who want to massacre their own children. This is all demonic, and you know there comes a point where you say, "Will the will the real Antichrist stand up, please?" But um, <laughs> Chesterton, in his book, is trying to defend Rome because Rome had the nicer gods, and Rome saved the world from worldwide Baalism by destroying Carthage, and thus we owe it a debt. And thus, <laughs> it makes sense that God would plant the capital of His church in. <laughs> what had been pagan Rome and now make it papal. It's an in, interesting in this chapter. Less unpalatable pagan yeah. city. <laughs> uh, you kind of have well, to. No. Augustine is going to, like, yeah. Chesterton was not listening to Augustine on no, this. No, he wasn't. <laughs> and he wasn't. even if, you know, even if that argument held water that the Rome, Roman gods were, were more civilized and nice, it kind of reminds me of Screw Tape, where uh, yeah. C.S. Lewis's characterization of Satan or of a a demon yeah. says that um, the devil likes to cure us of our great sins by giving us a dozen smaller ones mm. where like the Roman gods are so trivial. It's like, Oh, it's the door jam, but not the hinges. The hinges are a different God. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they've got so many little ones yeah. that uh, they're just not as monstrous in some ways as the Canaanite gods. And yet Nero claimed to be the son of God. <laughs> So, yeah. Another record, I mentioned um, Asimov, and one of the reasons he came to mind is he wrote a little short story called The Dead Past. Uh, the protagonist in that story is a, a scientist. There's, there's more detailed characterization and plot going on that I'm going to tell you, but he wants permission from the government to build a time viewer because he wants to look at Carthage and show uh, in real time, as it were, that they didn't really offer their children to sacrifices, that that's all Roman propaganda. And that is a common thought today. Uh, mm -hmm. Rachel, would you uh, tell me what you found when you were looking as, at Carth Carthaginian religion and such? Yes. As I was looking to try to find more of the details of their religion, for one thing, it's challenging because it is localized in that it's by each city-state, so there's slight variation. Um, but also... It seems like all the modern sources are very slow to reveal anything about it. It's very, everything I read was very vague, mm -hmm. very generic, using words that we would think of like they had festivals for prayer and for celebrations and just keeping it at this high level or talking about how they were so tolerant because they would allow those coming to trade and such to set up their own little idols in their temples. And so they were just the most tolerant religion and, and all of this. And if they did mention the child sacrifice issue, they often said they may have sacrificed children, but there's no real evidence for that. Or another source said, as according to the exaggerated biblical and Roman <laughs> accounts, <laughs> they did these things. Meaning the it, two most reliable and well-documented sources available about the ancient world. And generally the <laughs> reasoning given was, we're sure there must be sources out there that will contradict this because we're just so sure this can't possibly be. And right. yet, as you research, they have found, particularly in Carthage, but even back over in uh, Tyre and Sidon area, they have started to find remnants of burned, very small little yeah. corpses that they say, well, <laughs> these could have maybe possibly been children that were sacrificed. <laughs> but there there seems to be an extreme unwillingness to admit that because we have a sense that that's very evil and wrong. 
even though we in our culture people sacrifice their children but still um <laughs> we in that form horrifies us and so nobody wants to give this wonderful tolerant religion that horrible practice um i think only one of the sources i read also mentioned the requirement of women to prostitute themselves for uh astarte as part of their religious duty yeah. most of them don't even mention any of those elements of the worship yeah yeah i forgot about that little element um going back to the short story i was mentioning just to wrap tie that up um, the the author is or the the protagonist in the story is convinced that again that this is Roman exaggeration and that if you could go back and look at it uh, he would uh, he'd be able to prove it and the government keeps on denying 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 and won't give him the permits and it turns out that they won't let him build a chronoscope at a time viewer not because they're afraid of what he'll see in the distant past but what he'll see in the past two seconds ago. Because at that point, if you can build a machine that shows you the past, well, the past was just now, mm -hmm. which means you can now use it to look into your neighbor's homes <laughs> and their private lives, because that's the, mm -hmm. by the time you see it, it's the past and people will become voyeurs and addicted to it and there'll be no way to stop it. So nice, interesting story grabbing <laughs> on the, uh, starting with the wickedness of the, uh, the Carthaginians. It's interesting that you, Rachel, that you say that you can't find accurate details now. Uh, 80 years ago or so, 100 years ago, if you opened a Bible history or even a secular history that wanted to discuss the religion of Canaan, what they would tell you is that the religion was so perverse that they cannot print the details. And then, of course, we became more open-minded, and everyone started <laughs> printing the details. In or bloody... now they don't print them, and they just now they're a tolerant religion. <laughs> yes, now they've gone past. They've kind of kind of come full circle. You kind of wonder uh, if those scruples in not telling about such things contributed to oh, nobody's ever told us that there were such things. Yeah, uh, sometimes not telling is a mistake. If you're writing for mm -hmm. small children, maybe. Except when you're discussing the biblical narrative. I mean, there, there, there's a danger that I think most, most Sunday school children don't know what Baal worship was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, we do our children the grave disservice if we don't at least bring it down to their level where they can understand that, that this was not only profane and lascivious, it was extremely violent. Mm -hmm. And it was done in the name of their God. There was nothing, mm -hmm. nothing. Um, tolerant about this. And and perhaps we should talk about that next time if we could remember this idea that that the Phoenicians, the Baal worshippers were tolerant. Well let's talk about Jezebel. Poster <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, child yeah. for tolerance. Yeah, it's one thing it's one thing if traders come into your town, yes, you let them do their little thing because they're not trying to stake any claims. Mm -hmm. Let them have their, their their gods are real enough for them elsewhere. And they want to bring them into town, okay, but they're going to leave with them. Uh, if they want to put them in our temple under the service of our God, that might be acceptable. But do we recognize it as a valid religion here for us? No. And that's why Jezebel had to get rid of the prophets of Yahweh. Anyway, mm -hmm. so we can come back to that next time. Yeah, we've got a lot to cover next time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we should have known. We should We should have known, but we didn't. Have known we were that naive. We could never cover... All of a thousand years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most but they're just Phoenicians. How important could they be? Empires in the world. Uh, anyhow, we will get to that. But let's wrap up with some recommendations for tonight. Well, I'm going to recommend a book that I haven't read in ages, and I forgot how good it is. It's called They All Discovered America <laughs> <laughs> by Charles Michael Bolden. It's an older book. Um, I'll try to find the copyright date here. Uh, but should be easily available in old bookstores and such. Oh, it's only 1961, it looks like. Um, yeah, copyright 61. And it's uh, an account of the claims of, of various people for various people who have been discoverers of America long before Columbus. In fact, I think Columbus may be the last chapter. Uh, but it does have an excellent chapter on the Phoenicians with far more material than I thought it had. 
uh, I will not say it's the final word. I will not say it's infallible. I won't even say it's true. <laughs> but it raises a lot of questions that can't simply be brushed off by, oh, that's not orthodox archaeology. You don't need to pay attention to that. Uh, there's too many concrete things that do need to be answered. And maybe some future Christian historian will take the time to make that a life's work and find out what really happened in the ancient world. We'll talk more about that next time. Cool. I'm going to recommend Sleeping Beauty, the Disney mm. movie. Oh, <laughs> Lovely. Gretchen calls it ballerina nap. <laughs> <laughs> That's precious. And Why? I'm, so besides the fact that Gretchen oh, likes it, was another reason? Oh, there's not really another reason. <laughs> I, I would like what I would like to do in order to appreciate it yet more um, is watch the ballet with the ah. all the all the the music as Tchaikovsky intended, and then come back and watch the Disney movie as an adaptation of that original art form. I think that would be a really cool exercise. Sometime. Well, well one thing that I remember, I think I remember is that the presence of the the witch turning into a dragon and the the knight having to slay the mm -hmm. dragon with the sword of truth yeah is a mm -hmm. disney addition basically oh, they really? grabbed they grabbed it from the bible and western tradition and it hey. put it in to make it better and they they scored high it, it did it made it oh, a lot well better <laughs> well done disney yeah back in those <laughs> days all right rachel what do you got all right. I don't think I've recommended this so far, but I mentioned it in the last podcast, which is the Nancy Piercy book mm. uh, called Love Thy Body, uh, mm. answering hard questions about life and sexuality. And it deals a lot in the religious background on abortion and such things that we've been talking about to some degree today with child sacrifice um, and the ways that we create our own value for things and therefore devalue and kill others, um, either by abortion or euthanasia and such things like that. So it's a very insightful book. She has lots of excellent uh, research and statistics and various things for, for a lot of good thought about what's going on in our world today. Good. Cool. Thanks. Thank you both for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters for keeping the show rolling. We really appreciate you. And thank you, as always, listener, for tuning in. If you'd like to get a hold of us, uh, you can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Uh, I think we're on all the socials now. Um, I'm not involved in that process, but I'm sure you can follow us on Facebook, uh, at least. <laughs> Leave us a message there, or comment on the dank memes that are... I think going up, um, <laughs> we, through the whole, um, diecast media group. Um, oh, by the way, this is a production of diecast media group. I always forget to say that because it's kind of a new thing for this podcast. The work of marketing and such got distributed a little bit so that, uh, David and I are not the only ones making, making it, which should make it better because we were, we were spread pretty thin there. So, um, thank you to diecast media group for helping us out with this. Um, we hope you'll t tune in again next time and tell a friend about us. 